Good. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Valentin, for some very uh, lovely talks, this uh, r really spectacular work. Okay, so um, I'm the author of a package that's uh, called Revise, and the goal of Revise is really to allow you to start a Julia session, run some code, open that code up in an editor, make some changes to that code, and then have those changes take effect on the very next uh, statement that you execute. And um, especially if you're tackling sort of big programming projects that need to load a lot of code or a lot of data, I at least find that this is a significant uh, productivity enhancer. And I've spoken at JulieCon about Revise before, so, uh, but just to, uh, uh, for any who, who haven't heard about it before, just to very briefly summarize, I think the right way to think about Revise is really as a combination of diff and patch for code. So basically what Revise does is it uh, figures out which files are used to define the code uh, that you've loaded, and if it notices that you've uh, changed one of those files, then uh, what it does is it, is it computes a diff on the old version and new version of the source files. And so here's an example of, of such a diff. And then <coughs> it uses that diff to patch your running session. And what that patching looks like is something like this, where basically you go through the old expressions in the previous version of the, of the file, and any that are in the old one but not in the new one, if that expression defined any methods, you go through and you delete those methods. And then conversely, you go through and you look for any new expressions that weren't present in the old one, and you just evaluate those. And then that should create any new methods that the new version of the code did. So it's a very, very sort of simple underlying principle for, for how this, uh, for how overall how this, this should work. Um, and um, so Revise really, I think, has two key design goals. The original, only, it originally it only had the first one, um, and that is really is to try to mimic the effect of, of quitting your Julia session, restarting, and running the same thing again, right? So if you, if you do it in Revise while Revise is running, in theory, if Revise is doing its job properly, it should give you the same result. And there are a few, I've documented on the website, a few known things Revise can't do, like handle type changes and things like that. But aside from that known list, the goal is for there not to be much of anything else that it can't do. And we're still not there yet, but we're trying to get closer. The second goal that came up over time and has become a more and more important goal is to basically act as a resource for the current state of your code for consumption by others. And, and uh, uh, Lyndon gave some nice examples of that. Um, uh, I'm going to show you a quick demo here <coughs> in Juno. Um, and just, just to sort of show you why this matters. So here's a, here's a, here's a, a bit of code, right? I'm going to debug this function called debug me here, right? So I've included my code. You can see that this debug me thing is found on line eight of my source code. Sure enough, checks out there. And, you know, Juno offer, now offers this nice um, facility to uh, step into your code. And so <clears throat> it positions, you know, the, the prompt at the line that you're executing and everything's all, all nice and good. Okay, so the problem that um, sort of I've focused on a little bit here is, okay, so you see that this is, you know, down here at line eight of your code, but Juno also provides an editor, and so I can make some changes in my code here, and I hit save, right? And now, um, if I entered into it, <clears throat> and it took me to line eight, it would be emba both embarrassing and confusing, as far as the state of Julie debuggers goes, because internally it would actually be debugging debug me, um, right? Because that's what you asked it to do. But if Juno went to line eight, it would actually be in the middle of some other method, and that would be in incredibly confusing to the programmer. And as long as you're loading your code with revise, and that means either you're, you're, you're running revise, and then you either load it as a package, or you use this include t, um, you know, fortunately, you know, Juno doesn't do that. It takes you now to line four because it knows that's where your method is now found, right? So <clears throat> that's become a very important aspect of, of Revise's current mission is basically is to not screw that up, all right? And so I'm going to, uh, for the rest of my talk, is actually going to be kind of like uh, Jeff's talk about Julia on a much smaller scale, and that is what are the things that have sort of kept me up at night about how we actually, uh, you know, try to pull those off in the face of a, of a couple of pretty serious challenges, right? 
And I'm really just going to focus on two challenges that have annoyed the heck out of me uh, over, over much of the last year. And we're, I think, close to solving both of them. Um, we pretty much have, have one, the other one solved. So <clears throat> uh, I, I told you that Revise computes diffs uh, of expressions. Um, and, and that that's the basis of its function. So here's an interesting case because I've got a, a, a block here, right? And I, I have one of two different versions of foo that I'm going to define depending upon the value of this thing here, right? And if, if my code looks like this and I edit it and change this to false, the good news is, is that revise should work just fine. And the reason why is because even though I haven't edited foo itself, <coughs> All of this is defined in a single top-level expression. And so Revise sees that that overall top-level expression is different. And so when it evaluates it, it will overwrite the old method of foo with the new version of it, right? And so everything is just fine. But this is, it took me embarrassingly long to realize how embarrassingly easy it is to break constructs like this because all you have to do is you actually assign the value that determines which version gets defined to a variable. And then now you have almost the same block, but because because these are now two separate top-level expressions, you see the diff here, and Revise is happy to update the value of B, but it doesn't change your definition of foo because it, uh, it, it doesn't realize that the method depends upon B. So now your running Julia code is going to give you a different result than if you had restarted Julia and run it from scratch, right? The fact that Revise works at all for anyone, I think, is mostly a testament to the fact that there's not that much code that looks like this, right? But uh, it is really irritating to me that once realized that there was basically no technically feasible way of solving this problem with the uh, architecture that Revise had uh, as of about a year ago. And there actually are, I mean, I've seen literal examples where this does happen, it's just that they're rare. Problem number two is actually very closely related to that one, and it ha comes down to methods that are defined by code, much like those methods were defined by code, right? So here's a simple loop. Uh, it iterates through a list of types that I've manually typed out, and then it has this eval statement. And if you're not familiar with this, what this basically does is this loop iterates three times, and it creates three separate methods of this new function called size float, specialized for three different uh, floating point types, okay? So it creates three methods from these three lines of code but you know, easier or whatever than typing them out manually, okay? So now suppose I edit this block and I delete the float 16 version of this thing, but I leave the other ones up, right? In theory, revise should delete the float 16 method, but leave the float 32 and float 64 intact. And if it's really being sweet to you, it shouldn't force you to recompile those methods because you haven't changed anything about them, right? Um, so the problem is, is again, there was no old way of doing this, right? Because what revised to figure out which of the methods it would have to delete, it would have to actually really understand the meaning of this code. What is this code actually doing in order to define methods? The fact that it creates three signatures when you see only one expression defining a method is obviously problematic, right? And so my first reaction was, okay, I can beat this. I can sort of, you know, write something that kind of figures this out, right? But it doesn't take you long to realize that lots of code contains much more complicated things that end up defining methods. And this is taken from base, right? You know, there's this dictionary that gets assigned that sets rules for how the actual overall function in the end is actually named, right? And there are much more complicated examples than this one, right? And, you know, by the time you get even to here, you have to be able to sort of intuit at what a pretty substantial fraction of potential Julia code is actually doing, right? So that also seemed kind of like a problem, all right? And so again, you might say, all right, yes, but this is still a corner case because there, you know, yes, there are many more functions that look like this than the other thing, but maybe it's not that big of a problem. The problem is, is that this is only one example of it, and there are many other examples where we have code defining code. And by far the biggest case of this is actually any method that accepts keywords, right? So it turns out that the, that the keyword methods get split up into multiple methods, only some of which have the name that you assigned it, and others of which are generated automatically. And those are, in fact, where the body of your method live is inside these 
these generated names for your methods here, right? And so the problem is, is that if you want to go backwards from signatures, you don't know what was the original source of that method, basically, and so you don't know where to go look it up. And the consequence of it was, was that Revise was actually really, really bad at figuring out where many methods came from when it was looking at stack traces or stepping into code, right? Uh, so for base, it's about 13%. I think for actually most packages, it's even worse because there's probably more keyword function, uh, you know, methods in, in package code than there is in base, right? And so uh, this was going to give us a terrible experience for the debugger, for example, because it would position you at the wrong line of code for a very large fraction of active Julia code. Okay, so around December of 2018, I finally decided that I had to completely change the foundations on which Revise lived, and especially in order to sort of handle things like these and, and, and the much more common keyword case, what Revise really needed to do was to actually become an interpreter of Julia code. And that, believe it or not, more so than trying to write a debugger, was the origin of my involvement in Julia Interpreter, right? I needed it for Revise. Um, and so it had to be able to interpret code, top-level code. That's the main reason that, that, that the interpreter gained the ability to interpret top-level code and understand it well enough that it could do all kinds of code transformations. And some of the potential still not realized. This, that example I gave about the variable B and learning that other code depends upon that, a lot of the infrastructure for that is ready, but that's actually still not working yet in modern versions of Revise. But I think the other problems are, are largely solved. And so the consequences of this write, rewrite were actually, from the Revise standpoint, were four separate packages, Julia Interpreter, which uh, Christopher, Sebastian, and I um, uh, uh, introduced uh, uh, earlier in the conference, uh, lowered code utils, which is basically where I stashed a whole bunch of really, really nasty stuff um, uh, uh, whose solution I wouldn't have wished on anyone else um, and so that it could be reusable in case it, it's necessary for any other projects. And then the two sort of, I think, important packages, Revise is the one that you would use, but if you're interested in any of the kind of code lookup functionality Revise, the one you're really interested in is code tracking project, which is a very small, lightweight package package that's essentially the query half of Revise. And all Revise does is act as the server to populate the data tables of code tracking so that others can consume it without understanding any of the internal details uh, of Revise or pay runtime uh, or, or compile time overhead. Um, I think, I don't know how I'm doing on time. Um, th basically, what lowered code utils is solve this keyword problem, and the big problem it's trying to solve is the fact that every time you lower this code, this symbol is different, and so it makes it very hard to go backwards from stack traces or when, what, what, when you're in things, and so it, it sort of goes back to the name that's actually running. It's a, it, it's a painful but, but very important transformation. The consequences of the right were interesting. On the plus, there are many, many positive benefits from my standpoint at least, about this rewrite. I was able to close a whole bunch of bugs and revise. It could get down to the point of locating almost every single method in base, and I think that's part of what's made the, made the uh, debugger uh, infrastructure fairly robust, um, and all that was really good. There are some th concerns, and one of the reasons why I wanted to present was to let you realize how dangerous Revise is right now, in a certain sense, right? Um, so what Revise has to do is the first time that it parses a module, it basically re-evaluates the entire module. It literally steps through all the code that you use to define your module, and then at the very last second, when it's about to execute the expression that defines a new method, all it does, it punts on actually evaluating that and just extracts the signature, right? And that's the only thing that it does then. But it's really pretty scary to say, I'm going to run your module twice, basically. Once when you first load it, and then once when Revise decides it needs to parse it. And it only does that if you make changes, so that's good. But, you know, some code probably isn't safe to evaluate a second time, right? And so that's a potential problem. Global variables actually, in theory, present a, a similar concerns, and so I try to avoid affecting those too. Um, there are a few practical, I've been surprised at how little of a problem this has presented thus far. There are a couple of practical ones. One is this is what's currently blocking Revise from doing something it used to do just fine, which is track core compiler, and Valentin's justifiably uh, bothered by this, and I'd love to fix it, but, it, but it's not an tr entirely trivial thing to fix. And there has been one package which, is, which did a lot of initialization at top level in the package um, that was much more expensive with the interpreter, and this caused them to have to rewrite 
write it. And there's a workaround. You can put all your initialization code in a knit, and then you're fine. But I would agree with the authors of the package. It made it more ugly, and that's a problem. And so I'm, I'm looking for solutions. I wonder if we need an at once symbol to basically mark blocks of code to say, don't ever reevaluate this section again. I'm actively looking for input on this. Concern number two is just simply is revise is quite a lot more complicated and bigger than it used to be. And so the first time you have a revision, it's really quite a lot slower. And so that's something I'm actively hoping to make progress on at some point. So anyway, I think there are many, many good things about the rewrite. It's far more capable and better at understanding Julia code than ever before. There are going to be some good things, I think, that are yet to come from this. But there are genuine risks and downsides to this. And I'm, I hope you guys will you know, come with your gripes, tell me what problems you're having, because it's only by that mechanism that I'll understand, you know, where it's, where it's causing problems. Thank you very much. I hope I haven't gone over uh, time. And so thank you very much. Uh, revise is amazing. But I'm, I'm curious if you have an answer to this one problem, right? Um, I don't write code anymore because Julia writes all my code now, right? <laughs> Ju Julia, I just generate code and, and I act like I, I created it, right? But now that it doesn't actually live in a file, right? Like if I was to tell a debugger, it kind of yeah. does, doesn't even know where to go, right? Could yeah. there be like anonymous files that you kind of just generate on demand to kind of yeah. show it? Yeah. So, so revise actually captures. So one of the things about, about code tracking is it's not written this way, but you can do basically at the equivalent of at code expert to get the expressions that were defined. And this works even if you've not written those expressions yourself, right? So you can actually use revise to see what expressions are generated to define your methods. Um, and so, and revise will happily handle updates for a lot of these things because of this re rewrite now, so. Hi, um, I really like code tracking .gel. I think I'm probably the uh, biggest user of it outside of the uh, debugger yeah. folk. Yeah. Um, one thing you mentioned was that you can use code tracker without using revise to uh, not have the bigger load time from using revise. Well, okay, <laughs> let me clarify. I'm really glad you asked that, and, and I apologize for interrupting you. Maybe, maybe I haven't understood, but uh, if I said that, I should have clarified that. The user, Need, to get any ben, real benefit out of code tracking, the user needs to be running revise because it's revise that populates code tracking. But from the standpoint of a package author, the only thing you need to say is using code tracking, right? And then you'll get the full benefits of revises automatic updating of the location of where code is and the updating of the expressions of the current running version of that method, for example, but you don't have to load revise directly into your package. Right, so my thoughts are, right now, whenever I use code tracking, the line immediately before or after that is uh, import revise, because I need to be sure that revise is actually loaded, yes. and I figure if the user's loaded revise, then it's gonna load it fast anyway. Um, and I know that my code will just break terribly if code tracking doesn't have a database field. So is this about as good as I can go? Yeah, I, I mean, you're, you're right that if revise is already running, then, then that's easy. But I think what, one of the things I also didn't want was revise is a change in behavior, and I didn't want to force that on anybody. So that's the other reason for depending upon code tracking. So. Um, you mentioned that you solved the line number issue for the Juno users. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could do something similar for Vim users? It, 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 it should be completely 100% editor independent, but I haven't, I, it might depend on how they, oh, oh, yeah, so uh, let's see. If for, no, so, so I, I believe that I've, oh, I know. Anything that actually looks at the line number field of a method, that won't be correct. I actually can't touch that for a variety of important reasons, but um, if you, uh, in the printouts of those things, they get you, you get lied to as the user. You give the actual current uh, uh, location of it. And the easiest way to do it is you just make use of code tracking and ask where it is. There's a where is function that will tell you the current location of, a, of something. Yeah. 
that, uh, yes, there are tests, so if, as long as the tests are doing what they say they should, that, that should actually be fine. And again, one of the advantages of going to the lowered representation is I kind of no longer have to worry about that, whereas the old mechanism was pretty hacky for handling those kinds of things. I, I should also, one other thing I should say is if you've had problems with revise, actually, uh, uh, Cedric has been a terrific bug reporter and test case reporter. I, I really owe him a big shout out of thank Thanks, and he reported a really, there was a really bad bug that just got fixed two days ago, so, uh, at this conference. So, if you've had any weird things that revised deleting methods that it shouldn't have deleted, hopefully that's been fixed now, so, yeah. All right, thank you so much, and I'm sorry if I... <laughs>